we are now going to look at the methodologies for developing courseware. So in this lesson, we're going to look at tutorials as a methodology. So interactive, how to design interactive uh, tutorials, interactive in tutorial software, and how to design draw software, draw and practice software. Okay, these are two different set of of softwares. Now, when you talk about the tutorials, you are looking at like an omnibus of uh, all that we do in the classroom. <laughs> so, you are uh, you you are teaching as a teacher would do. So, let's look at um, this uh, uh, G L the learning uh, um, that is done on TV. Uh, GLTV or so, where they teach these kids. You see, um, they present the information, and then at times they can give uh, assignment uh, um, practice for the student to do. Um, they wait a while and then show the answers. Now these are this. Uh, uh, because it's on TV, it can be interactive. But you are going to develop a software that is going to teach like a teacher. So the student will read and be able to follow. So the, the language should be said that it's like a conversational language. Welcome to this lesson. In this lesson, I'm going to teach you A, B, C, D. So, when you do that, it leads the person on so you could, um, the person can follow you through. Okay. So, let's look first at tutorial. Okay. This is still the course. Okay, so let's look at tutorial. When you look at a tutorial, is a software um, on which the instructional sequence on a topic is similar to that of a teacher's classroom instruction. So you are teaching like a teacher will do in the software. You are teaching like a teacher. So the teacher will start with an introduction. The teacher will warm them into the main lesson and then the teacher will give practice and the teacher will give an assessment to test to see whether they understand then on the whole the teacher gives a, a summative evaluation to see if they have understood everything that is the end in the end okay so that is how a tutorial looks like Now, let's look at the types of tutorials. Now we have the linear tutorial. This is most often what people normally do. The linear tutorial doesn't take into account differences in performance. So um, if you're a PAD holder, you come to the system and you take it, you go through the same process as a class one child. That is the linear, that is what most of the people do. Now we have branching tutorial. Now when we talk of branching tutorial, we are looking at where we have alternative path. What do I mean by that? Um, I'm a teacher. I come to use, let's say, I, I, let's say there's a software uh, that teaches courseware design okay i'm teaching courseware so if i'm using that tutorial i should be able to move to the advanced stuff if someone is not learning how to uh, how to uh, um, develop tutorials that person will need what is a tutorial that person will need the types that person will need this that or that but then for me, 
I need to have some advanced knowledge. So I need to branch straight into the advanced stuff. Whilst for you, because you are now starting, you need to start from the base and move on. But if you design a, a, a linear tutorial, it doesn't take into account all these things. If you need to go through everything, you go through everything. But for branching, it looks at maybe how you respond to questions, how uh, you answered certain questions, um, your age, um, your experience. A tutorial can ask you, okay, what is your experience in uh, uh, designing tutorials, beginner, intermediate, advanced. So if you pick a, a beginner, then it takes you to the beginner part and then moves you through. Okay. What are the benefits of uh, tutorial software? Now, tutorial software provides immediate feedback on student performance. So after giving assessment, you immediately, the student immediately see their results. And then it saves teachers time correcting students. So once everything is in the system, the student goes there, takes the quiz, gets the result and then uh, sees the answers okay it also motivates it also motivates students to practice so um, you give them practice within because they can do the practice and then if they lack anything come back to check on the content and go back to practice they are motivated to do so and it is also self-paced. The student move at his or her own pace. Now, let's look at the limitation. The limitations are that um, constructivists are criticizing uh, tutorials. Why? They feel that um, it is a directed instruction. What do I mean by that? You are trying to teach them what you think should be done. But they are not trying to construct their knowledge. It is teacher-centered. That is how they see it. They see it as teacher-centered. But they feel everything must be student-centered. Okay. Then there are a few packages that are good. A class, a very good example of a tutorial is my Mavis Beacon. I, I love that software so much. It is very good. It is very, very good. That is a classic example. It only reflects on one instructional approach. The problem is that, let me take uh, the teaching of um, photosynthesis. I don't know how you'd want to teach photosynthesis, but for me, I would want to. I would want student to observe fruit, and then uh, tell me uh, what they think about it, and how they, what benefit they derive from it, and then, so. What do they think are the reasons these fruits come, or what what is behind it? So students would would brainstorm, and then I would come to the realize and tell them that okay, the just as we humans eat and store part for future use, so are the food, uh, so are the trees. So the trees make their own food. And that is what we call photosynthesis. Now, if I do this, somebody might not want to use this method. Somebody might see it as, oh, well, this is complex. Let's use a simple thing, like tell them, look at the sun, look at water, uh, look at the green leaf. 
the 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 plant use water the green leaf to make its own food to survive so there is no one method of teaching so if you are simulating a teacher's classroom uh, instruction then there will be a problem that is one thing people criticize the uh, tutorials for let's look at the general structure we have the introductory section, the presentation, questions and response. You judge the response. So the introductory session, just as in the in the normal classroom, you come, you introduce a le your lesson, and then so when you introduce your lesson, then you go on to present the main lesson. Now after presenting in presenting the main lesson, you can give uh, uh, questions, you can give, so that they give responses, you judge. Now, you judge the responses. Now, the presentation of information and the questions and responses uh, is cyclical. Because, <laughs> let's see this. You can give a question uh, or a quiz depending on how well they get it you can now present the information again and also um, you present the information you give them the quiz and then if they get it you, you come to present another information you give a quiz whether they get it or not you you you, you there is that cycle okay now you judge the response when uh, if it's a, a final something um, you need to give them feedback you need to give them feedback um, you are giving the students a quiz you have judged and seen that they have had two over ten you need to give it to them and then if it's 2 out of 10, then what do you do? If it's 2 out of 10, then you need a remediation. And the remediation is to go back to the presentation of information. If there is no remediation to be done, you close. So this is the structure. This is the structure. So we're going to go through step by step and know what goes on at each stage so that you can uh, critique the tutorials you, you have been given. Okay. The introduction of a tutorial must have presentation of objectives. You must present, the tutorial must present objectives. Now, um, Though the presentation, there should be presentation of objectives, um, it is not always mandatory for the student to see the presentation of objectives. Look at um, a KG, a P1 child. Uh, the child, it may not be necessarily that we show the child that by the end of the lesson will, will learn this, this, and that. But you can put the presentation of information somewhere so that somebody can click, look at the objectives. The presentation, look at the objectives. Good. But then for adults, or let's say for primary, maybe GHS, you can present the information, uh, the objectives. They know what they are going to study about so that it informs them. Okay. There should be stimulation of prior knowledge. There should be stimulation of prior knowledge. You just uh, what we normally call uh, uh, RPK. So you need to stimulate their relevant previous knowledge. You link what they know to the new lesson. Just as I when I was looking at the um, 
when I was using photosynthesis as an analogy, I said that just as human beings prepare their food and store for later use, uh, plants also prepare food. So I've linked their prior knowledge of human beings preparing food and putting it down. Then there must be pre testing. Pre testing is, is good when you want you are doing branching tutorial. So that you pre test and know the person's level and know where to place the person. So you can select uh, let's say questions at random. Let's say uh, level one questions, level two questions, level three questions, level four questions, and then you give them to the to the learner at the beginning so when the person answers you have about 10 questions the person is able to get 10 out of 10 then it means the person is an advanced user so you take the person to the advanced knowledge the person has one two three then you take the, you let the person start if you have used maybe become you see, when you are starting, it gives you a typing uh, a practice. Depending on what you do, the, it places you at a level. And that is pre-testing. Okay. Let's lose a uh, presentation of information. Now, for this, we have done this in a previous lecture. So, there must be consistency. Um there must also be so these are the uh, um, the recommendation recommendations you might uh, refer to the lecture on the on the general features of software for learning for detailed information or presentation of information it is the same thing here mm -hmm. Refer to the general features. Okay. Let's look at questions and responses. Questions and responses. So, for general features, what I will, uh, for the presentation of information. What I would say is that you must look out for uh, whether the text is suitable, the videos. It is when you are presenting information, hmm, please, it should not be that everything must be a video. That is one problem, one issue novice have. Everything they think. Uh, tutorial is all about YouTube videos. So they are teaching, you are teaching photosynthesis, you go and pick YouTube videos and dump them there. And then, now when you do that, uh, though they may be teaching well, you are not giving way to a local content. Your student must feel you when you are doing that, when you are teaching yourself or using a local video, or demonstrating and then capturing it allows you to use local content which will help them not only youtube videos that are usually foreign okay so go through the general features this is the then questions and responses now we have reasons why we put questions in there so the structure is such that you teach, you give a small assessment, they get it, you continue. They don't, you present the information to them again, they get it, you present the information to them again, they get it, they move on. They don't get it, they don't move on. That is it. So why questions? Why questions? Questions would keep the learner attentive questions will provide practice easy 
some of you may may not be visiting the platform because you think there is no quiz so if there is a quiz you go and read and then come and, and do it. Okay. it encourages deeper processing when you give questions students now begin to think okay um it assesses how well learner remembers and understands the information and provides a basis for program sequencing so when the student gets a question right or wrong it provides you the basis upon which to make a decision whether to let the student go on or stay on stay back okay there are different types of questions we have multiple choice questions so you have the stem let's say who is the president of ghana we are in 2020 so a uh, john dramani mahama b nana adudankwa ekufuado c um dr kwame nkroma d kojo uh, okay so you have the questions the stem there you have an answer and then you have the distractors okay so in this instance the answer is nana abdanko okay so that is a multiple choice question then we have marking questions marking questions uh marking questions um is is it's not normally done in written question uh, in, in paper and pencil uh test marking question is okay yeah it's normally done like underline maybe the verb in this sentence so we can say kofi is a boy kofi is a boy so on the computer they cannot underline so you can say click on the click on the and the verb in this sentence and that then you have two or four questions you know them you have matching questions of matching questions so uh, in a category a you have let's say personalities category b then you can have the uh, uh, political parties so you match who is who okay then you have completion questions completion question is um Uh, the process through which a plant makes its own food is called mm -hmm. so you need to complete it then short answer questions so they are they can be completion by then these ranges from a word to a few a, a few set a, a sentences okay When you are setting question, what are the factors that affect the comprehension? Assessing comprehension. So, um, questions frequently assess required recognition, even when they should assess uh, are intended. <laughs> so, normally, uh, the the easiest set of questions we do is uh, questions that assess record record but then we must have questions that assess comprehension to assess comprehension there are three question types you can 
you can use a paraphrase you can ask them to paraphrase you can ask them to a, a new application then you can make categorical questions categorical questions um, you can give them a question you can teach them uh, you can give them a question and then um, so you can teach them about let's say plants and you ask them about uh, let's say shrubs and you ask them about trees or plants in general you see you want them to be able to relate the knowledge in shrubs to answer the, uh, the questions on trees or you teach them trees and you want them to answer a question on uh, uh, hibiscus flower okay the factors are another thing is the reading level you must check the reading level you must check abbreviations mm. when you are teaching when you are, you are asking questions uh, you must remove abbreviations because because if everyone has a way of interpreting abbreviation unless you explain okay i think i remember there is a, a, a story whether i don't know whether it's real or a fun story where somebody went to store a pwd uh, cable public waste department cable and then he was taken to court and uh, the, on the on the on the item it is written pwd not public works department so he went to court and they asked why did you say oh i didn't steal it the guy said oh i didn't steal it but we saw this with you no it is mine my name is paul wilson daniels so it is mine I have written the PWD, it's mine. So, <coughs> each and every one has a way of interpreting abbreviations. So, you must be careful. The negative words, not. If you have to use not, then you need to let it stand out, maybe in caps or italicized or bold, so that the student will see. Scrolling, there shouldn't be scrolling. Um, if possible, it must be one question per page so that the answer the question takes the person to another question. But if they have to scroll down to answer more questions, a student may finish and tell you, I didn't see a question was down there. Okay, let's have this commercial break. Uh, at the end of the semester, I think we can have a dinner here. Yeah, I hope. Uh,
Okay, so would you take a chance? Okay, that is a commercial brick. Then we have looked at questions. Let's look at how to judge the responses. When you ask a question, let's look at how to judge a response. <coughs> now, there are possible judgments. One is the response is correct. So you can ask a question. Um, Nana Adudankwa Akufuado is the president of Ghana, true or false? Now, when somebody picks true, the response is correct. Good. Okay. Now, a response may contain an expected error. Okay. Assuming you ask a question like this. Um, uh, let, let me let me use this example. Um, how many regions has Ghana? How many regions has Ghana? Now, someone can write 16. That is 1, 6, then 16. Then someone can write in, in words 16. So which one do you want? You see, if you expect the 1, 6, you should also see an expected error of that 16 in West. Okay. Now, the response can contain an unexpected error. At times, you don't know what a, a user might do then. He types something, assuming you want how many regions has Ghana. And somebody comes to type K K Q A C C. It 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 is not going to give you any any proper response. Okay. So if if you are using Java, if you are using C sharp, you need to handle exceptions. You need to handle these exceptions. These are unexpected errors, so you need to handle them. Okay. Then the response the response can be partially correct the response can be partially correct um assuming you want them to list two benefits of uh, being a citizen of a country two benefits and they list one 
It is partially correct. It is partially correct. So you need to know. And uh, a response can neither be right nor wrong. There are certain responses that can neither be right nor wrong. Can we have an example? An example is... Uh, Um, let me use politics. Uh, his excellent, a uh, former president, John Dramani Mahama, will be the president, can be the president of Ghana uh, uh, come December 7th. True or false? Okay, in this case, when you say true, he can be the president of Ghana. It is true. He can be the president of Ghana because he had been a president of Ghana. So it is possible they, uh, 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 he can be voted for. The answer can also be wrong because if somebody chooses wrong, the person might also say that, oh, um, Though it is likely he can be voted for, it is likely he can also not be voted for. So, the answer cannot be right or wrong. If I, if I say true, it can be right or wrong. If I say false, it can be right or wrong. Good. Now let's look at response types, some types of responses. Then we have single selection, single selection question. So like, such as multi-choice question, we have multiple selection, such as marking question. So select, click on the verbs in this sentence. So let me say a, 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 a sentence like um, Mr. Duncan is making plans or Mr. Duncan is planning to embark on a journey. So is planning embark. Yeah, so you can have multiple selections. The numeric response is just as I said, how many regions has Ghana? So you can have a numeric response 16. Then single string question, such as a word. Uh, so completion uh, 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 questions can be ways. Then we have multiple string questions, where a student will provide a phrase or a sentence. Then we have numeric plus string sentence. Uh, a question that asks for one meter. So one meter, one hour, two days, three hours, uh, 300 kilometers. These are numeric plus string responses. Drag and drawing. So you drag and you draw. Then essay. Okay. Now, when you are judging questions, you need to look at the length. So if you are designing, you need to put limit on the length so that if a length goes beyond a certain limit, you can just say that it is wrong. You need to check that. 
If not, if you want to evaluate each response, it is going to take the program style. <laughs> so, um, a way plants make their own food is called the process. It's called you know photosynthesis. So, the answer should not be more than the length of photosynthesis. Okay. The time limit. Um, because uh, the, the import of asking questions in tutorials is not for, for accuracy, but for mastery. Uh -huh. You want them to master the content. So you don't, you allow them time to, to answer the questions at their own work. But if if you want speed, then that will be in a drill. Mm -hmm. Okay, then help and escape options. As as they are engaged in the question, you must give them room to terminate. Okay. Let's look at feedback and responses. Now, feedback is the reaction of a program to learner's response and may take many forms. So, when students do something, what you you give back is the um, feedback. Mm -hmm. When you are giving, when student answers a question correct and then you show an image giving a thumbs up, that is a feedback. Now, feedback must be positive. Every feedback must be positive, must be corrective. It must correct them and it must follow immediately. It should not be deferred. Hmm. Okay, let's look at remediation. You see, we should not think that we are all the same. So, if students go through the materials they they cannot be on the same level so they go through the material they take the quiz if uh, they don't get it well you must provide room for remediation that is in a low, you say remedials you must provide room for remediation so you can present to them the information again Okay, so that is it about remediation. Okay, let's look at learner controls in tutorials. Now, let's look at paging. Hmm? Page controls should be obvious. That is the screen. Screen one, screen two, or slides, if you are using slides, these are the pages. Uh -huh. So controls, the buttons, the menus must be obvious. You must see it well. And then it must be consistent in position. You must avoid time. It must not move by itself. Let's look at help. Help. Um... At times, if you give them questions, they try once, they try twice, then they ask for help to see the answer. Uh -huh. That is the help we are talking about here. So, um, you must provide percentage of interactions attempted correctly and answered. So, you can, there are tutorials where you see the number of attempts and how many you have answered correctly and that can inform you as to how to give the answers to them but the, some hints are at first request if the person tries tries at first request let's say um, you ask uh, the process of the process whereby plants use uh, 
carbon dioxide photo uh, um, chlorophyll water to make their own food is called now they try try and they see the help they click on the help for the first time you show them a hint you show them a hint of the answer and then you encourage them to try again now if they try the second or the third request then you give them the answer so the second request that they want to help on this you give them a hint but then the third you can give them the answer you must also keep track you see in some in some um softwares you have some number of tries so as you try you you exhaust your tries your, your help so you you should keep track of the number of tries so that you can you can advise them to try instead of just asking for help help okay so this is all about tutorials this is all about tutorials let's meet in our next class for drills so watch the next video that is on drill methodologies drill methodologies